Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this special Tenebrae service at Resurrection Lutheran Church. We welcome all of you and thank our choir and our vocalist tonight for their presentation. We are going to be doing a little differently than we've done in the past. This is St. John's Passion, so we will hear uh, music that's been prepared by our vocalist as we read through the Gospel of John. Um, other elements of the Tenebrae service will be as you've seen before. We uh, ask that when the service is over that you leave the sanctuary quietly and we will dismiss rows from the back to the front. So if you're in the front, just be a little bit more patient and we will dismiss rows from the back forward. I invite you now to rise as we begin with the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading and also the text for the homily for this evening is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, beginning at the 13th verse. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness, so will he sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This text is a familiar one on Good Friday. It's the appointed lesson for Good Friday. And it reminds me of just how front and center in the story and the telling of Jesus' death, the wounds of Jesus are. A few years ago, I was trying to choose a Lenten devotional for the church I was serving at the time, and I found several titles. It's a hard thing to find a devotion for Lent that works for everybody, so I usually spend a little time kind of puzzling over that. 
But as I was looking at all the different titles, I noticed there was one that was focused on the wounds of Jesus. Much too grim and depressing, I thought, and so I went right on to the next one. As we see from our lectionary reading for tonight, you can look away from the wounds of Jesus for most of the season of Lent, but by the time Good Friday is here, there they are. And as we learn from the prophet Isaiah, those unavoidable Good Friday wounds are not the grim and depressing spectacle we might have feared they would be. Yes, they depict what our Lord, the suffering servant of Isaiah, would undergo. But they actually bring us something that we need, the rest our weary spirits long for, the ability to hold on to Jesus' gift of abundant life in the face of suffering. Tonight we hear those familiar words about the wounds of the suffering servant by the prophet Isaiah. Tonight we see in our own mind's eye the form of Jesus, friend of, se of sinners, healers of the sick, and Lord of the nations, suspended on a cross where he would suffer and breathe his last. Tonight we do not look away, but we see in all of their profound and sublime glory the wounds of Jesus. Evidence of human violence, pride, and wrongdoing. Evidence of the sins of the world, the sins of every person who has ever lived, and of course, evidence of your sin and my sin too. And seeing in his sacred wounds, we rejoice that Good Friday really is good. Seeing his wounds and hearing God's promise through his servant Isaiah, we find healing restoration, and peace. In chapters 52 and 53, Isaiah talks not only about the wounds of Jesus, but also his marred appearance. It seems especially appropriate for a day on which we often sing hymns like, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, as we did today in the 12 o'clock service. Jesus' head and face might seem at first like a strange focus for a meditation on the wounds of Jesus. Why his head? Why not his hands, his feet, and his side where the nails and the spear went through? Well, Jesus' head bore that terrible crown of thorns, an emblem intended by cruel soldiers to mock him, yet one that would become a sign of his own humility and sacrifice. Jesus' brow would have been bathed in perspiration, his eyebrows wrenched in profound pain. His lips would have uttered words that reflected his love for those around him despite his suffering. He did say, I thirst, but also, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. Father, forgive them. Today I will be with you in paradise. The goal for this evening is not to turn the most important day on the Christian calendar into a display of grief on Jesus' behalf and nothing more, as if he needed something like that from all of us. If we're sad and it's okay to be sad, it's not out of pity for Jesus, it's out of remorse for our own sins, the sins that put him on the cross in the first place. A devotion I ran across this past week puts it like this. If we gaze at Jesus' sacred head, are we shamed or delighted or stricken or honored? And the answer is yes, all of the above. The hymns that we sing tonight dwell there. Words from that hymn, O Sacred Head, What thou, my Lord, hast suffered was all for sinners' gain, Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. Notice how that mine gets repeated inside the hymn. Maybe on the one hand it's a sort of to work out the meter, but it's also to emphasize that I am responsible, you are responsible for the suffering, pain, and death that Jesus experienced. We are confessing and owning doubly that our sin, all our sin, put Jesus on the cross. The suffering servant, first described by the prophet Isaiah and applied to Jesus Christ by the early church, makes the point especially clear. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. The good news, of course, is that the Good Friday event doesn't stop at the trauma and anguish that Jesus experienced on the cross. Isaiah also speaks of his, of his legacy, what would follow. And the truly good news is that on the cross, the wounds of Jesus spill blood that paid the price for our sins. The good news is that on the cross, the wounded one was obedient unto death. That when he gave up his life on the cross, all that needed doing for our salvation was accomplished. The white hot core of the gospel is not merely that Jesus revealed the love of his father for the world when he gave up his life on the cross, though that certainly is an important part of that gospel message. The white hot core of the gospel is that Jesus suffered hell on the cross. The hell that you and I deserved. On Easter Sunday, that invisible truth is made visible. With his words from the cross, it is finished. It is accomplished. Jesus demonstrated that he had made good on the promise that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him may not perish eternally, but have eternal life. The healing wounds of Jesus are therefore signs of his sacrificial death that have won salvation for you and for me. Any homily on the wounds of Jesus would be incomplete without a final reckoning of what happened in the midst of Jesus' resurrection appearances. I know what you're thinking. It's not Easter yet, Pastor. Wait a second. Don't go there. But hear me out. All four Gospels make it abundantly clear that somebody, somewhere, had a hard time believing that Jesus was truly risen from the dead, just as he promised he would be. First, it was the women at the tomb, as we see in the Gospel according to Mark. Then it was Jesus' other disciples, as we see in Matthew and Luke. And then it was, of course, Doubting Thomas in the Gospel of John. It's not Jesus' glorified appearance, however, that brings the assurance that their Lord and Master is present with them. If you really read carefully between the lines, especially in St. Luke and St. John, it's the wounds in Jesus' hands, the wounds in his feet, that convince these terrified and anguished disciples that their Lord is really and truly present with them. Even the body of the resurrected Christ bears the wounds of his crucifixion. Reminds me of an experience I had a few years ago when I was attending a Stephen Ministry leadership training. She said when she was in the middle of it, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, that in the midst of that suffering, it was relief it was a strength for her to know that the lord of the universe had suffered too that he knew something of what she was going through and that when she suffered physically it was in some small way very very small tiny way an inkling of what jesus christ himself was going through on the cross there is a kind of bond a connection between those of us who suffer one with another and of course with our loving Savior on the cross. That's where the wounds of Jesus take us, to the connection that we have with our loving Savior, to, yes, the sacrifice for our sins, the gift of salvation that he has won for us, and the love of God which is ours through Jesus Christ. I'd like to quote one of the verses, one of the stanzas from O Sacred Head. And this kind of sums it all up for me. What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend? For this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end? Oh, make me thine forever. And should I fainting be, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love for thee. We see the wounds of Jesus tonight. And in them we find our healing, 
our restoration, and our peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. You have poured out upon us your never ending love by giving your Son, Jesus Christ, unto death on the cross. Give us, Give us grace to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Strengthen the ministry of your holy church that we, your people, may confess the dying love of Christ to all people. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We continue with St. John's Passion with a reading from John chapter 18, verses 1 to 11. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials with the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of these, those that you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me?
John 18, 12 to 27, Jesus denied by Peter. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You are not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold and the servants and officials stood around the fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I'd said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Jesus before Pilate. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial unclean, uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, 
What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him before your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words of Jesus had spoken, indicating the kind of death that he was going to die would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside in the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and the chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born. And for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him! Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate had come out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me... I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate asked. Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat him on the judge's seat and the place that is known as the stone pavement, which in Arabic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified.
Continue from John 19, latter part of verse 16. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Continuing with verse 23. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene.
Continue the reading from John 19, picking up at verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is accomplished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
continue with verse 31. Now it was the day of preparation, and by the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came to break the, and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as the other scripture says, they will look on, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. When he accomplished, he was a, accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.
to stand together as we read the responsory. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Let us pray together softly. Our Father, Father Lord, 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 Lord. Jesus. 